If you go ahead and take your Bibles out or your device out and, or borrow a Bible from the chair in front of you and turn to Luke chapter 19. We're continuing a study through the Gospel of Luke. That's our practice here, if you didn't know that, at Calvary Chapel. We teach through books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. And we're currently looking at the Gospel of Luke, which is a biography of the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And we're, we're probably about eight, nine weeks from the end of this study, but we'll see, have to see how it goes. Before I uh, jump in, would you go ahead and join me with a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for your word and for the opportunity to teach and study your word. As always, Lord, I pray that this time will be glorifying to you first and foremost, but I also pray it would be good for your people. It would be helpful for them, edifying for all of us as we delve into your word and see the truth that is there, live, on, live by it, learn from it, and love it and embrace it fully, even those parts that may be more challenging, oh Lord. Now we commit this time to you, and I pray for your help, your empowerment, your grace to teach this word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In a way, I'm going to be switching gears today. Uh, if you've been here in the past, you know I'm not really a speed uh, freak when it comes to going through these studies of the Bible, and we've been almost a year now in the Gospel of Luke. We usually take one or two paragraphs, sometimes three paragraphs. But we're going to look at a little longer section today because we're now switching from the teachings of Jesus primarily to, to more of a narrative, to more of what happened. And to really get the point, you have to look at the bigger picture. Uh, in a way, looking at every little minutia of detail can actually hinder us from understanding the fullness of the text. I mean, when, when a person goes into a museum to look at a work of, of a painting, you don't see that person up there examining every little stroke of the painting. To really get the artist's message, you have to step back and look at the whole picture. And sometimes you have to do that with scripture, not spend so much time on every little verse, every little word, but look at the big picture. And that's what I hope to do today. But we will be going a little quicker. So if I skip anything or if you have questions about anything, email me, contact me, see me after the service, and I'll be glad to help you. This section has one primary theme, and I'm, it's so important, I'm going to put it up on the screen in a moment. It's so important, I don't want you to lose track of it in all the details. And the primary theme deals with the kingship, the authority of Jesus. And here's the main idea. This is the primary overarching theme. Real simple. Jesus is the promised king, what we call the Messiah or the Christ. And he has all authority. And even though he is the promised king and he has all authority, only a few will accept him as their king. And many will reject him as their king. And you're going to see that thread, that truth, weave through the next few paragraphs of this study. Now before I begin, let's go ahead and backtrack just one verse. Pastor Josh did a wonderful job covering the parable of the ten minas last week. Uh, but I want you to backtrack just one verse to verse 27 because you're going to see how it all connects when we get to the end of this study. And this is like, I mean, this is, if this is your favorite verse of the Bible, we need to talk. Let me read it to you. Here's what Jesus said. But as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, to be their king, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Eh, that's not your favorite verse, right? Understandably so. Nobody holds this verse up at a football game. And then somebody looks it up and says, aha, you know, what's that all about? But there is a truth here that's going to ring throughout the next few paragraphs about Jesus' kingship, some people rejecting it, and the pretty severe consequences of rejecting his authority in your life. Amen? All right. So here we are. We're a few days before the crucifixion. There's a reason Jesus is amping things up. He's, we're only five days before the crucifixion of Jesus. This is, what's, <coughs> excuse me, this is what's commonly called the triumphal entry. Jesus is getting near to Jerusalem, but that also means he's getting near to his greatest rejection. This is the time where people will say, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. Jesus knows this. This is already starting to develop in people's hearts, so he's addressing that rejection of his authority. With that said, let's go ahead and read verses 28 through 40. It's also up on the screen for your convenience. <clears throat> now, this is right after verse 27. So this is the next thing that happens. And when he said these things, he went on ahead 
going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Beth Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied and on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And, at, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the, all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So this is the triumphal entry. We often celebrate this on what we call Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, five days before Good Friday, five days before Jesus was crucified. And the main idea here, and I'm going to show you how it develops, but the main idea is that Jesus is proclaiming himself to be the promised king, the Messiah. Now, to really appreciate this, you have to have some knowledge of the Old Testament. The original readers did, most of you do, but some of you don't. So let me kind of backtrack just a little bit, not a deep study, but just as a reminder. The, in the Old Testament, starting all the way back at the first book of the Bible, God had promised to send what we now call a Messiah, Savior, or Christ, and a King, all wrapped up into one individual person. And the people were greatly looking forward to this person. And Daniel, we're told that this king would be a world ruler. He would rule the entire universe. In the book of Isaiah, we're told his character would be that of a wonderful counselor, very familiar Christmas verse, Isaiah 9, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. We're told these great things about this king, and the idea is that the Jewish people were looking for that king. But what the scripture also told us is that many and most would reject his kingship. That's also in the Old Testament. In fact, we see in Psalm 2, you see this being foretold. In Psalm 2, verse 2, it says this, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, God the Father, and against his anointed. That's the same as the word for Christ, the king, the leader, the savior of all. And that, here's what they say, let us burst their bonds, get rid of their authority, let us burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us, but he who sits in the heaven laughs and he holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is God speaking, saying, you may not like it, you may not surrender willingly to it, but this is the king. Jesus is the king, Jesus has the authority, and then there's a warning at the end of that. It's going to correlate with what we see here in these chapters of Luke. In Psalm 2, verse 12, it says this. Kiss the son. That means submit to him. That was the way they, they would often kiss the hand or the ring of the son. Kiss the king. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in your way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. But blessed, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. So Jesus is proclaiming himself to be that king that Daniel told would come would be the world ruler, that Isaiah said would be the wonderful counselor and the prince of peace, that Psalm 2 said and many other texts said he would be rejected but would still be installed as king. And the multitudes of people understood this. This is who we've been waiting for, the king who brings peace and joy and healing and hope and restoration of all that is broken. Many understood that that's exactly what Jesus was proclaiming in the events that we just read about. We know they understood it because in verse 38, they quote from a royal cor coronation psalm. Psalm 118 was the coronation of the king. And here's what they quote as Jesus rides along. Blessed is the king, verse 38, the king who comes in the name of God. The Lord. So the main idea is Jesus is saying that person that's been talked about for 4,000 years in the Old Testament, that is me. 
Jesus proclaims himself to be king in several ways here. He proclaims himself to be the king, the Messiah, culturally, because in that age, in that day and age, whenever somebody was becoming king, becoming leader, what people would do, they would always have an entourage, they would have a large multitude of people, there'd be lots of shouts and lots of noise, and the people would take their cloaks and they would lay them out, sort of the red carpet treatment, and that was a proclamation. You see this in the Old Testament with several kings, people laying out their cloaks, that was a way of saying, you are the king. And in those days, when a king entered a place, they entered in spe with special, I guess the word, I don't know if the word vehicle is right, but mode of transportation. And the mode of transportation actually said a lot. Kings always entered on one, on one or two modes of transportation. Sometimes kings came as a warrior king. We're coming to conquer you, to defeat you. And when they came as a warrior king, they rode on a white horse. That's how Jesus is coming back in Revelation 19. But when they came as a humble king to rescue and to help and to heal people, they rode on a donkey. Now, we may not think, we think of a white stallion as very regal and a donkey is, oh, that's a donkey. But in that culture, that was just as regal as a white stallion. The difference was, how was the king coming? To conquer you or to help you? Jesus is coming to them, as was prophesied, on a donkey to help his people. Here's what it says in Zechariah 9, several hundred years before Jesus was even born. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, that's Jerusalem, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is proclaiming himself to be king culturally, the, the cloaks on the road, prophetically, riding on a donkey, uh, miraculously. I mean, you may not have paid much attention to it, but Jesus is in, is in control in a, in a unique way here. He tells his disciples, hey, you're going to be walking down this street. There's no, this is not like you can call ahead and say, I need to have a car rental prepared. Jesus says, go into the town before I get there, just the first donkey you see. Start untying it and bring it to me. Well, what would you do if you see somebody starting up in your car in your driveway? You'd say, nuh-uh, right? But Jesus says, if that happens, you just tell them the Lord needs it, and they're going to just say, okay. That's divine control. So Jesus miraculously, culturally, prophetically has proclaimed himself to be king. And the disciples rejoice in that. That's what it says in verse 38. The whole multitude of disciples, those who've committed themselves to Jesus, began to rejoice and to praise God. That quote, where in verse 38, is from Psalm 118, verse 26. And here's how it goes. In ancient times, in ancient Israel, when the king was being coronated, whenever he is being inaugurated would be our term. He would be, there'd be a whole crowd of people proceeding to the temple. And they'd be shouting, they'd be shouting the whole way, laying out their cloaks, shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then when they got there at the temple, the leaders of the temple, the leaders of Jerusalem would respond, according to verse 26 of not in Luke, but in Psalm 118, the leaders would respond, we bless you in the name of the Lord. That's how it worked. The people shouted, blessed is the king. The leader said, we bless you, the king, in the name of the Lord. But here's where things went wonky. Because instead of the leaders of Jerusalem receiving Jesus and responding to the people's praise, they knew this verse well, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. What do they say? Teacher rebuke your disciples they're wrong that's unacceptable I want you to notice something in verse 39 they said there and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him to Jesus teacher rebuke your disciples you could a tra another translation would be rabbi rebuke your disciples they were giving Jesus a place of respect. Teacher, rabbi. But they were not willing to give Jesus a place of authority as king. Verse 38, they called him king and they blessed him. Verse 39, they called him teacher and they rebuked him. 
And it dawned on me that everyone is living in one of those two verses. You're either in verse 38, where for you Jesus is your king and authority. Not just somebody you go to it for advice or when you have a need, but he rules your life. When it comes to decisions about sets, relationships, money, politics, work, gossip, how to handle offenses, what to do with your time, what to watch and what not to watch on television, and every other aspect of your life. If you're in verse 38, Jesus is king of that. He's not just king on Sunday mornings. He's not just a religious leader. He is your Lord. He is your king. But for many are really more like verse 39. They admire Jesus. They say, oh, we can learn a lot. He's a good spiritual leader. He's a teacher, but he's not the king. You're in one of those two places. You're either accepting him as king or you're rejecting him as king. But Jesus is proclaiming himself to be king. He's making it very, very clear. And then in verse 40 there, here's what Jesus replies to their rebuke. He says, he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now that's, a, that's interesting. This actually has, I believe, a double meaning. In one way, the most obvious meaning is clearly there. Jesus is basically saying, now get this, this is not what somebody who's just a teacher says. He's saying, I am so great that if people don't shout my praises, the rocks are going to cry out in my praises. And we joke about it being the first Christian rock concert. Okay, it's corny, okay. <laughs> but there's another interesting thing here, and you're going to see how it fits in with the next passage. Because there's actually a prophecy found in Habakkuk 2, verse 11. Not against Jerusalem, but against Babylon, the enemies of God. And here's what God said to, to this group of people. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork, woodwork will respond. So in this case, the stones crying out was a reference to judgment coming. Because, and the way they cried out was being cast down. All the walls being destroyed, all the buildings being destroyed. And it appears that Jesus had both meanings in mind. I am so great, the inanimate creation itself will praise me, but also he's warning of judgment to those who have rejected him. And we know that because of the very next section. So to keep it moving, let's go ahead and look at that. Luke 19, verse 41 says this. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you, Jerusalem, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you to the ground, you and your children with you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now here's, I'm going to give you a few sub points, but here's the main idea here. It's just real simple. Jesus says, that there's going to be a consequence for rejecting him. And when the Jerusalem, the Jewish people, the citizens of Jerusalem rejected him, he said there's going to be a severe consequence. Ultimately, there's going to be judgment for rejecting him. And we see that, for those who know history, this happened 40 years later, almost exactly 40 years later, in A.D. 70, well known in Jewish history, that the Roman armies did exactly what Jesus described here. They surrounded the entire city and they destroyed it so much that not one stone was left upon another. Exactly as Jesus said. You cannot reject Jesus with impunity. If you reject his authority, you're subjecting yourself to judgment. And that's not an easy thing to say, but let's face it, Jesus did not pull any punches. He did not hide this truth in some kind of fine print in the Bible. He made it clear, and he made it bold. There are also several other truths I want to share with you here, just a couple main ones, and I think they're important. Here's the first one for those who like to take notes. Jesus is brokenhearted over our destructive spiritual choices, but he will not prevent us from making them. Jesus is brokenhearted over our destructive spiritual moral choices, but he will not prevent us from making them. Jesus knows that the choice that the people are making to reject him is destructive. And it breaks his heart, not for himself, but for them. It says in verse 44 there that he wept over it. And the word for weeping there is a deep wailing. He is not just like a 
tear coming down his eyes. Jesus is emotionally distraught because these people are making choices that will bring destruction to their own life. But you know what? He didn't stop it, and he didn't soften it. He wept over it. And I say all of this because some of you might be making destructive choices in your life right now. And you may be thinking, well, nothing bad's ever going to happen if I do this or do that. You may think, well, God loves me too much. He, he's going to stop it. Or he, if he didn't really want me doing this, he would stop it. Or if he didn't want me doing this, if I get in trouble, would it just be a slap on the wrist? No. He weeps over it. He warns you. But he won't stop it. He won't soften it. He's brokenhearted. And some of you who are parents who have, an adult, who have adult children know exactly where this is coming from. Because you see your kids making decisions that are destructive and it breaks your heart. But you can't stop it. They're their own people and they make their own decisions. I say this to encourage you that maybe now's the time to turn around before that day comes. A second truth I want you to note is this. Peace with God is available, but you can reject it. You can miss God's gracious offer. Jesus says here, listen, he says, if you had known, if you had been receptive the day of your visitation, a day that could have been joy for you, peace for you, healing for you, blessings for you. But they didn't receive it. We're told in verse 42 and again in verse 44, Jesus said, would that you, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. Peace. And in verse 44, he said, but now, the, but then he says, but now they are hidden in, from your eyes. And then in verse 44, he says, and they will not leave one stone upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, if you read this passage without reading any of the rest of the Bible or reading any of the rest of Luke, you might come to the conclusion that the problem here was ignorance. Because Jesus twice says, you're going to experience judgment because you didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't know when peace would come. But that's not the problem. It's, it's kind of a, it's ignorance, but it's willful ignorance. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like the guy, I've seen people do all kinds of things. I was a police officer for several years, and people would say things like, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to go 100 in a school zone. I didn't see a sign. Yeah, you couldn't see the sign. You blew it over. You know, they say things like that. And I've seen people claim do their dog as a dependent on their taxes and then say, I didn't know. I didn't know that was wrong. The problem was not that they didn't know. The problem was that they were unwilling to surrender to Jesus' authority. We know that because in er earlier chapters, here's what Jesus said in Luke 13. Verse 34, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often I would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which they never did. The crowds did, but not when Jesus got to Jerusalem. Not yet. I see this, and I really feel, and I always like to apply scripture to our life, that, that God can say that about many of us. How often I have wanted to bless you. I've wanted to pour out good stuff in your life. I've wanted to have a relationship with you. I've tried to gather you in under my protection and under my authority, but you were not willing. Don't ever look and say, well, God just must not love me. God doesn't want me. God doesn't want to bless my life. If there, there's only one person unwilling in this relationship, and that's you, if that's true of you. Not God. In fact, he says, I've tried many times. You've refused to come under my authority and under my protection and under my blessing. So the main idea, and I don't want to lose track of that in all these side points, is that Jesus is the promised king with all authority. Some will genuinely accept it. We saw the multitude of disciples, but many will reject it. That's what happens to the city of Jerusalem and to the religious leaders. It continues with that same theme of verse 45, where it says this, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. 
And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. So Jesus, once again, is proclaiming himself to be king. How is he doing that? Well, he's doing it prophetically. He knew the Old Testament. Of course, he wrote it, in a, in a sense. And he, they, they knew the Old Testament. And he, the Bible had said, here's what's going to happen. In fact, the very last book of the Bible said what would happen when this Messiah king would show up. In Malachi 3, verse 1, it says this. Behold, I send my messenger, that's John the Baptist, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, because everybody's saying, oh, we want the Christ, we want the Messiah. We said, he's going to come. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the same place Jesus is now, and the messenger of the covenant, the new covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But then he warns them, behold, who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and he's like a fuller's soap. In other words, you're all saying, oh, we want, we want the Messiah. We want the king. We want him here. But he says, you're not ready. Because you're saying that you want him, but when he comes, he's going to do some cleaning up. He's going to clean up his temple. He's going to make things right. In fact, we're told in Psalm 69, verse 9, Jesus, this is about Jesus. For zeal for your house, for the temple of the Lord, has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach me have fallen, reproach you have fallen on me. So Jesus comes into the temple, and you know the story, all the details aren't here, but he makes a whip, he drives out the money changers, the animals, it's chaos. Jesus is angry with a righteous anger because they have turned what should be a spiritual place to honor God, to help people where prayer and worship and Bible teaching goes on. They've turned it into a place where they can make a buck and walk in hypocrisy as a den of robbers. You know what a den of robbers is? It's where criminals feel that they're safe to continue to be criminals. And it is sad when the temple of God becomes a place that's about business and hypocrisy. And today, you are that temple. And Jesus will not allow unclean things and hypocrisy to remain in your life. He's going to drive it out. And he will not allow it. He will judge. There's, there are places all over this nation and all over the world that have turned the church into a business. They run it like a business, and it's, a pro it's all about profit. And Jesus will deal with that. Now, when Jesus, but those are side points. The main thing is Jesus is proclaiming himself to be king because the temple is the highest place. And if, if Jesus acts with authority in the highest place, he has authority in every place. Think of it this way. This is something you can probably relate to. Any of y'all shop at Walmart? I shop at Walmart. I'm just going to be honest. I shop at Walmart, okay? So, and I'm not, not putting Walmart down, but let's say today I go to Walmart and Amy and I need to get some groceries. We got a whole cart full of stuff and we get up there and there's only two cashiers, there's lines backed up halfway down the aisle, and the cashiers are moving like this. And you see three managers over there talking and having a good time, and nobody's paying attention. Could you, could, could you imagine if I went over to the intercom and said, all help, come to the front, and then look at two managers and say, you're fired, you're fired, and if you don't get your act together, you're fired. No matter how much I hate what's going on at Walmart, I can't do that. But if Sam Walton were still alive, and he walked into any Walmart, he could do that. Do you see the point? Jesus is saying, I can do this because of who I am. I am the king. And as king, I will not allow hypocrisy and ungodliness to remain in my temple. Now, I want you to understand, we're not talking about in this building when we say temple, the Bible teaches that you and I, Christians, are the temple of God. And he will not allow it to remain. We need to deal with it before Jesus deals with it. Amen? Yes. Jesus is the promised king with all authority. Some accept him, some reject him. We even see that here. The people, what were they doing when Jesus was doing all this? It says they were hanging on every word. But the Pharisees, it said they were planning to kill him. That's about, that. If you, if, you don't, if you think, you talk about rejection. If they're planning to kill you, that's a form of rejection. Amen? We can agree on that. All right, so Jesus continues in verse 1 of chapter 20. Same theme. 
It says, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the, with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who, is, who is it that gave you this authority? And he answered them, I will also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now here's what's happening here. And it so correlates with our culture today. Here's a group of people that's trying to find a way to undermine Jesus' authority, to reject his authority, to disregard it in their life. So they come to him with a seemingly innocent question. But I want you to understand something, and you'll see this a lot next week. Many questions are not real questions. They're really disguised objections. They're meant to trip up, to trap, to undermine. They're not seeking information. And just like this group of people was doing everything they could to disregard and undermine Jesus' authority, many groups of people are doing that in the world today. I'm not crying martyrdom. I'm not saying in, in America, I would agree we have great freedoms and generally you can be a Christian and be safe at it. You're not going to go to jail. You're not going to get attacked. But let's not disregard the fact that the media, television, entertainment, politicians, authorities in every manner are seeking to disregard and undermine the authority of God's word and Jesus' words. Just look out there and you'll see it. So they come to him, they say, well, we don't know that you have the right to do this. Show us that you have the right to do this. It reminded me, like I said before, I was, many, many years ago when I was in my 20s, I was a military policeman, and every once in a while you'd go into somebody's house, either there's a domestic dispute or somebody's, I pull somebody over for you know, drunk driving or something like that, and you get this arrogant, mean-spirited person, and they would say, I don't have to listen to you. I don't even know if you're a real military policeman or a real police officer. Prove it to me. Well, the badge, the car with the lights, the gun, these handcuffs I'm about to put on you, the, the walkie-talkie hearing you talk. Well, I don't know if that's enough. I don't know if you really are the authority. That's what people would do. And you say, well, you're an idiot. You know? Well, here's the thing. People are saying, they're saying to Jesus, by what authority? By what authority? They're asking him a question Jesus has already answered repeatedly in every parable, in every miracle, in his open teachings. He's proclaimed himself to be the Son of God, to be the King of Kings. They're not really asking the question because they're uncertain. They're asking the question because they don't want to come under his authority. Jesus has not made this some kind of secret. And because of their insincere questions and their, their sinful motivations, Jesus just says, I'm going to reveal that you're not really in this to, to get true information. So instead of answering their question, Jesus asked a question. John the Baptist, where did his authority come from? Now they have a problem. Because John was very popular. And if the people say, well, it came, if they say it came from God, Jesus could say, hey, you didn't listen to him. If they say it was his own authority, he didn't really come from God, they're going to be stoned to death. So they said, we don't have an answer. And Jesus says, well, I'm not going to give you an answer because it's not a sincere question. Now, before I move on for the sake of time, here's what I want you to note. I believe the Bible shows us, and what I've always encouraged, if you have questions, real questions, encouraged, let's ask them, let's seek the truth in the Bible. But I'm telling you, there are many people who read the Bible looking for loopholes. They are not reading the Bible looking for truth. They're looking for any, oh, I found this. This proves that homosexual behavior is okay, or, or this proves that I don't have to pay taxes, or this proves that, that there's many ways to God. Looking for what they want to hear. No different than this group of people today. Absolutely no different. Not wanting Jesus to direct their lives. So Jesus is now going to, kind of come full circle to where he began. Remember we ended that, that, with that verse 27. Bring those who do not want me to reign over them and slaughter them before my eyes. And now he's going to tell a parable, very similar to one we've heard before, that emphasizes that truth. Here's what it says in verse 9. 
And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it, lent it, out, let it out, lent it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. And when the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would, so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And therefore he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one they also wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to himself, themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now when they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now, this entire parable is about rejecting the divine authority of Jesus. And I think it's pretty apparent, but just in case it's not fully apparent, I want to kind of give you the key, kind of the legend, you might call it, to understanding this parable. The vineyard is God's kingdom. The tenants are the Jewish people. They were supposed to produce fruit. God-glorifying, God-directed lives. But they weren't doing that. They were religious, but not righteous. And so God continued to send to them prophets to warn them, get in line, start doing the right thing, trust in me, follow me, obey me. But prophet after prophet after prophet, called servants here, were rejected. So as the final end of what God was going to send as a warning, he sends his son, the vineyard owner sends his son, saying perhaps they will respect his authority. But instead of respecting his authority, they reject it, kill him, why do they kill him? Because then they can be their own authority. The vineyard will be ours. We will rule. Autonomy. And Jesus says, here's what the owner will do. He will take that vineyard, that kingdom, and give it to another people. And he's talking about how for temporarily, how God has taken the kingdom. And for the most part, the Jewish people have rejected the kingdom of God. And now the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, have become, for the most part, the church of the living God to do this, produce the same fruit, God glorifying, God directed lives. And while all of this is about Israel, the truth of rejecting the authority of Jesus applies to everyone. They, verse 14 says, this is what they said. This is the heir. He's the ruler. He's the one in charge. Let's kill him. Why? So that the inheritance may be ours. Now that's an important part of the story, the parable. Because it shows us the motive behind rejecting Jesus' authority. What is that motive? Well, a fancy word for it is autonomy. We want to rule our own lives. Here's what, here's what I want you to understand. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time here. But we'll get done in plenty of time. Our entire culture does not want to do wrong. They just want to do what is right in their own eyes. See, a lot of people say, well, I, I have a moral code. I believe everyone has a moral code. The question isn't whether you have a moral code of right and wrong. The question is, do you do what is right in your eyes by your heart standard? Do you follow your heart or do you follow the word? This group says we want to do what is right in our own eyes. Let's get rid of this authority. And that's the same motive behind rejecting the Bible and Jesus' authority today. Got real quiet in here. As I was thinking about this last week, I was a uh, I have a, I've told you about it before, but there's this, I guess you call it a forum. It's a, it's a, a place for discussions on the internet called Reddit, R-E-D-D-D-I-T. And you can sign up for whatever you're interested in, or Christianity. Those are the kind of things I'm interested in. And I'm looking at the Christian Reddit. They call them subreddits. 
And there's thousands and thousands of posts a day, but I'm looking at one post on there. It really caught my attention because there was this Christian couple, man and a woman, young man, young woman, in their 20s. And I, I wish I had printed it out. I didn't think of it. But here's what they basically said. Listen, we're living together. We're not married. And we're having sex. And we're Christians. And we don't see a problem with that. I know the Bible says you shouldn't do it, but I just don't see a problem with it. It's a good thing. It has developed our relationship, and we're committed to each other, and we think it's okay. So it seems right to us. And I've seen that many, many times. But what really shocked me, and there were hundreds of replies to this, in this, this is a Christian subgroup. Only Christians sign up for this for the most part. 99% of the replies were, it's not a problem. God's okay with it, as long as it's okay with you, as long as you feel good about it. Follow your heart. You will follow your heart to hell. And I felt for this couple, and I didn't interact with them because I don't normally get into those kind of, I don't think Facebook and places like that are the face, best place to get into these kinds of debates. But this group had rejected Jesus' authority in the parable, or that's what the parable symbolizes. And they wondered whether they could do that without consequences. And Jesus clearly says no. He says, what will the owner do when they find out how, when he sees the rejection of his son? And Jesus says, he will come and destroy them. Now I want you to notice in verse 15, let me find it here in my text their response. Let me read the entire verse. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard this, they said, surely not. Because in their mind, there's like, okay, I know it might be the wrong thing. Maybe we shouldn't have done it. But, but no, God's not really going to do something that drastic. That wouldn't be very loving. That wouldn't be very right. Surely not. I've had many people look at me and say, surely not. I, I, know, I never came to Jesus and I'm a Hindu or I'm a Buddhist or I, I, you know, but, but I'm a good person. Surely not would God send me to hell. Surely not. And it says this. Note the wording. Then Jesus looked directly at them the very people who said there's no way first of all we would reject the king and there's no way there would be punishment afterwards and here's what Jesus says first of all in verse 18 or verse not verse 18 but uh let me find it here in verse 17 he looked directly at them and said what then is this that was written this comes from that same 118 we were talking about earlier the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now that may not make a lot of sense to you, but what he's saying here, this was a coronation psalm. The very person, the stone, that the builders, the leaders rejected, Jesus, has become the cornerstone, the very foundation of the building. Everything else is built upon that cornerstone. So he's saying, he's saying it was already told ahead of time that you would reject me. God already knew that. But then he gives an important saying. Here's what it says in verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. People quote this and even sing it in songs. I don't think they always know what it means. The stone is Jesus. He's the cornerstone. He just said, I am the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken, and everyone on whom it falls, it will crush him. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an old Jewish proverb that's going to make it a little clearer. It comes from the same idea. If a clay pot falls on a rock, woe to the pot. And if a rock falls on a clay pot, woe to the pot. In either case, woe to the pot. Jesus is saying here, if you fight against me and my authority, you will be broken to pieces. But if you don't fight against me and just reject me silently, you will be crushed. 
This is not pleasant. This is not palatable. This is not something you say to grow a church. But Jesus is saying, if you reject my authority, you will not do so with impunity. There will be severe consequences. I understand that that does not fit in with what we like to hear, what seems agreeable to us, but we'll go right back to that truth. Are you going to do what's right in your heart or what God says? What will you believe? The culture, the world, or the word? This brings us all the way back to where we started. Verse 27, where Jesus said, and Josh taught last week, bring those people who did not want me to reign over them and slaughter them here before my eyes. If you get angry about today's message, remember, I did not write those words. And they are... I don't know how, they could not be any clearer. But you have a choice. Everyone has a choice. Remember, Jesus was brokenhearted. He wasn't pleased about this. He was brokenhearted. He wept about those who were rejecting him. What is that choice? Well, it's in that psalm we talked about earlier, the very last verse, Psalm 2, verse 12. Kiss the Son. Surrender to his authority, lest he be angry. And you perish in your way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But that's the other side of the coin. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. I've done that. Most of you have done that. I want the whole world to do that. But at the end of the day, it's your choice. You can reject him or receive him, but you cannot do that with impunity. The choice you make. Either way, we'll have consequences, either good or bad. I hope you will choose for him. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for your word. And we love your word even when we are challenged and find it stepping on our toes, challenging our feelings, contrary to what the world believes or we find palatable. Help us to embrace your truth. You are king. You have no rivals. You have no equal. And we readily say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I pray that's true for everyone in this building, but for any who it is not true for, I pray today would be the day when they switch their allegiance from themselves and their own rule of their own throne and their own lives. And I pray they switch their allegiance to you to receive of your blessings. I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for bearing with me today. If we sing one last song, I'm going to ask that our elders would go back to the events table. I want to ask, listen, if you want a prayer for anything, they'll be glad to pray for you. Slip out of your seat after the service or during this last song. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to make sure that you are one under his authority and you've not done that, go back and talk to them. They will pray with you. They won't embarrass you. They won't call you down front. They just want to talk to you and pray with you. Let's stand up and worship the Lord.
same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing will stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, by the name of all names, nothing can stand against. Let's sing this out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes I will, for all my days, oh yes I will. Amen. 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 It's a heavy word, but a true word. Amen? So we put our hope and our faith in Christ so that we don't have to experience the crushing of the rock. Amen? All right. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.